Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center's State Delegation Update for June 11th, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. I am so pleased to be joined once again by State Representative Denise Provo and State Senator Pat Jalen. Welcome back to Somerville Media Center. How are you both doing? Senator Jalen, how are you doing? I'm doing very well and I'm very happy to be back here with you. Um, well, as well as can be expected for the fact that all of my social interactions involve screens, uh, except for my family. But, but we are healthy and we should be thankful. That's the way thankful. I look at it. Representative Provo. Um, I'm fine, thank you. I'm glad to be here. And now we dispense with titles and it's Denise and Pat. Um, so welcome back. I know that there are a lot of things that we want to talk about today. Um, and before we get to the main subject, um, why don't we start with Senator Jalen? You have some things from the Senate level that you want to update and talk about. Um, Representative Provo will take it from the House side. And then we'll talk about, um, I think, one of the most important issues that we any of us can be having is the right now, during a time of social distancing, how do we address social justice? And we'll talk about Black Lives Matter. We will talk about the demonstrations. We'll talk about the initiatives of defunding police. And I want to get your thoughts on all of that. But why don't we start with Senator Jalen on the Senate side? Well, first of all, I'd like to announce that tomorrow, uh, the committee I chair, Labor and Workforce Development, is one of three committees. We're holding one of the first listening sessions the Senate is holding about reopening. What will it take um, to reopen safely? Uh, what are the barriers? What can we do in the Senate to make it possible for, the, for economic recovery? So we'll be hearing from labor leaders and business leaders um, and the secretaries of economic development and labor. So if people want to watch, it's at 11. It's a, uh, I think it's a four or five hour hearing. Uh, it's not a hearing, it's a listening session, um, but it's one of the first and unfortunately, uh, we will be separated from one of the main barriers to reopening, I think, which is early education and care and, uh, and education. Because if daycares can't open safely um, or can't open at all because of the regulations, I don't know how people are going to go back to work. And we need to look at the unemployment um, regulations to make sure that if people don't have a place for their kids to be safe, they can't go back to work and they need to stay on unemployment. So those are the some, but those are some of the questions we're considering. Um, let me have the hearing um, tomorrow, a oh, listening session, sorry. And I would say that daycare, I think is emerging as one of the biggest issues that we have, that how can we keep kids safe and still allow them to be children? Um, I can't imagine children not sharing toys, not touching each other, not touching their teachers. Um, being in small groups is fine, but the kinds of barriers to growing up are really very difficult. So uh, are we thinking, Senator Jalen, let me ask you one question. Are we thinking hugs are off the table for daycares going forward? They are discouraged, yes. I don't know how they're gonna do it, Senator, but please go ahead. They don't either. So the other issue, I, I do want to th say that I think we have all been thinking a lot about um, justice. And so we will talk about that in a minute. But um, the other issue I've been thinking about a lot is nursing homes and other kinds of congregate care for older people. Uh, as you know, um, more than 10% of the people in nursing homes have died uh, of coronavirus. I mean, people have died of other causes, but Nursing homes were already in a financial crisis and with fewer people there uh, and more expensive um, needs for PPE, for staff, uh, they are now short 40% of their staff um, and they had to try to get people by any means they could. When the federal money goes away at the end of July, there will be no money for the needs of the, of the nursing homes. We're gonna to have to restructure and we need to think about, um, rethink all the ways that we care for older people. 
um, and think about all the models. Maybe change uh, what kind of nursing homes we want and what kind of services we want in assisted living and can we make affordable assisted living so poor people don't have that choice or working people don't have that choice. So those are the things, kinds of things I've been working on. Well, I, I'll tell you what, they are all important, Senator Jalen, if we have time at the end, um, you know, we'll, we'll have time uh, to readdress some of those things. But Representative Provo on the House side, did you ever think your last year of serving the public would be so relaxing? <laughs> I never, I never could have um, visualized this year. I never could have predicted it. Um, but, you know, this is, this is the way it is turning out. And so I am doing my best to keep up with the many and varied needs of constituents and to respond to their concerns. Uh, and yes, this week I'm hearing from a, a lot of them about early childhood education, as it's called. Um, but, you know, one thing I'd like to speak about, because I've seen questions about it on the list serves is the elections this fall. Mm. Uh, the House passed a bill last week and the Senate, I think, has passed a very close version of it since then that um, that strives fairly successfully, I think, to um, to make sure that as many people can vote as want to um, at a time when when there's a, a serious contagious disease in the world. Um, Massachusetts is in the peculiar position of having a provision in our state constitution, which prohibits us from no excuse absentee voting. Um, it's very odd, but we have a magnificent set of workarounds. We have, ex we have early voting, and we also have um, an expanded vote by mail problem, which created this clever workaround um, to the effect that if you're avoiding going to a polling place because you're at risk from COVID, from COVID or you know it's against medical advice or whatever, that you're considered disabled for purposes of qualifying for um, an absentee ballot. And there are provisions to make it uh, easier to get an absentee ballot. There will be more outreach. Uh, it, that said, it's- um, so, so Representative Provo, can I, I, I know that, I know both of you very well, and I know you, you are terrific public servants. I am not an elected official, so um, let me cut through it. Sure. When any Somerville voter requests an absentee ballot from the city of Somerville elections department, yep. and it says why, my advice is put down COVID-19 <laughs> and then move on. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that that's going to be, that they're going to put that on the ballot. But essentially, um, you know, in, in legal terms, we have, we have joined up COVID-19 to the existing categories that exist. If um, I've learned anything since yesterday, I think you both know what I was doing yesterday. Uh, if we could make it easy on people, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> you know, I, I have I have done my best. Um, you know, I I sponsored and voted for amendments which were not adopted. Um, you know, I thought it was a mistake months ago when we set the primary election date for September first, which is moving day for so many people. Um, well, it may not be this year because we don't know. When well, you know, ev even on June 1st, there were um, U-Hauls all over Somerville. People are not staying put because of COVID. That's true. Um, but I, I think that, that setting, setting a primary election for the Monday before Labor Day was, was not a great idea. Um, but 
but there are some there are some better ideas circulating. Um, you know, you had raised the question earlier of how do we move social justice forward uh, when we can't meet face to face, and the answer is we do it this way: the Progressive Caucus meets every single morning uh, mm -hmm. on a Zoom meeting. And there's some overlap already between the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus and the Progressive Caucus, but you know we've had we've had even more overlap lately to hear about that caucus's priorities. And yesterday, the Speaker's Office announced that it had reached an agreement with the Black and Latino Legislative Contact, an agreement in principle to pass their their top four legislative. Um, agenda items. So that's very good news. I don't know how soon it will be, but um, it was it was very quickly resolved. Then it's a, a great segue right into what I think. Um, well, just Joe, I just want to correct one thing, which is the Senate is taking up the voting bill on Tuesday. So we haven't done it yet, but we will do something soon. We have to do something soon. Okay, coming from Joe Lynch, and you can tell your colleagues I said this, get it done. Okay. So, so I want to segue Next right in. Right away. <laughs> I want to segue right into um, the serious topic of the day is how do we address as a society social injustice during the time of social distancing? Um, demonstrations have been held. People are, are outraged over the behavior of some police in this country. Um, George Floyd was murdered by a policeman using excessive force. It triggered a reaction like I have not seen in a long time in this country. Um, for those who are too young to remember uh, the race, what we, you know, the media said were race riots in the 60s, and into the 70s, there were war protester riots, um, nuclear, anti-nuclear folk riots, but all during those past 50, 60 years that I've witnessed it, I have never seen the outpouring like I have seen in the past 10 days since um, Mr. Floyd's murder. It rises now that it's incumbent upon all of us to think about how do we create a new system? Because quite frankly, there's a lot of people who are using the terms, the system is broken. I don't think it's broken. I think it was built this way. So the question comes in is how do we rebuild it? You don't throw everything away before you have a new system in place. So I'm going to I'm going to stop pontificating. I'm going to ask you, Black Lives Matter, the protesters, um, demilitarizing the police, defunding the police, uh, recreating the police. Take it away. Either one. Well, just to to build on the, the comment that you made about how, how you don't um, abolish what you have in order to start over. That's what Camden, New Jersey did about seven years ago. And a lot of people are, are holding up that model of just rebuilding a police department from the ground up. Um, is that the best model? Is it the right model for every city? I just don't know. Um, and just a, in terms of, of why now, I think it's a function of time. Um, and one of, one of the the time elements is how many people are at home. Mm. And a, a young woman brought it up at the vigil on Sunday night over in East Somerville. She said, we have nothing to do but sit and watch the news and watch George Floyd die over and over again. And at that vigil and any other remembrance where um, the, that amount of time, almost nine minutes is marked out, it's so excruciatingly long. And if you just imagine what it's like to have a knee choking your breath off for that amount of time, um, I, I think many people have put themselves in that, in that imaginative space. 
uh, it, you know, there have also been other other incidents too, like the um, Amal um, Aubrey in Georgia, and you know, they're, they're kind of flickering at the edges of our our COVID consciousness, but they're not good stories. It's not a good look. Amy Cooper is not a good look, um, you know, for white people, for the human race. It's just, um, so, so everyone's time at home intersecting with experiencing um, the elapsing time of that particular killing, I think, has has just ignited fury in people who who maybe tried to give the police the benefit of the doubt or say this doesn't have to do with me or it wasn't in my city and it's just flaring up and combining with all the other injustices including the racial injustices embedded in the covid pandemic representative provo somebody asked me the other day why are people in somerville so upset about the murder of a black man in Minneapolis when we have never had that kind of an event here in Somerville Police Department and Somerville. Care to add a succinct thought on why we should be upset about it? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. There have been police killings in the past. Um, I, I defended one when I was working for the city in the, in the eighties. This was, um, this was a, a police killing in, in August of 1981. Um, you know, there were a couple of jailhouse suicides um, and other allegations of excessive force. So it's, you know, I, I think in Somerville, um, there's been a lot of work to improve policing. And our police department has improved a lot in my 40 years here. Um, but, you know, I, that's not to say that, that, that there aren't, um, that there's not a place for evaluation and assessment. And, um, and I think that day of reckoning has come. I think it's come. I think it's loud and clear. And unfortunately for us, it's a little late. Um, we should have been having the conversations uh, 50 years ago, you know. Um, Senator Jalen, I want to turn it over to you. Your thoughts on today, as far as we know, um, demonstrations are going to continue. People are going to continue to ask for it to divert funds away from the militaristic police look that we have in this country and give it to education, give it to mental health, give it to somebody else. Your thoughts. Well, I th let me say, first of all, that I think that one thing that's different this time is the sustained uh, number of people coming out and actually growing. Uh, so I think that's very important. Um, I'm, yes. So the message that I've gotten when I've talked to people of color is don't make up your own ideas. Listen to us. And so that's where my focus has been, is first of all, listening to the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus, their recommendations for, for state legislation. I know Just Us Somerville is making recommendations. Maybe they're not the ones that I would have suggested, but those are where I would start my focus is. So, in, so just to be clear, Senator Jalen, Just Us Somerville is a new startup Yes, and I don't know that much about it, but I'm interested. I think there has been a lack of, of public leadership um, by minority communities in this in our city. Uh, we have uh, two elected officials of color, um, so I listen to them. I listen to other people who have been not just uh, those people, but people who have been affected. Um, by police violence. I hope it doesn't stop uh, with the, the first focus is going to be on police violence, but then underlying that, I hope we will think about the economic inequality that has given people fewer chances to get ahead. Um, that if people are locked out of opportunity, sometimes 
uh, they find other ways and that's what the war on drugs did. So I'm glad that we've begun to reverse that. Let I me make one, one comment, Senator Jalen. Would, would it surprise you to know, and I don't think it will surprise either one of you, you mentioned that the city of Somerville have two elected people of color. Would it surprise, to, would it surprise either one of you to know that the United States Senate <laughs> only has two people of color? That's indicative, I think, of what people are so upset about. And it's related to the lack of economic equality because what is the percentage of members of the Senate who are millionaires? It's, it's not insignificant, I can't remember what it is, but it takes a lot of money to rise to that level of power. So economic power and uh, political power are so deeply connected in this country. It's e economic power, political power, and I think what's happening, what you're seeing right now, and I hate to go, I hate to give away my age, but go back to the 60s when it was people power. So I think what you're seeing right now is this movement, this rise that current generation think to themselves, if it could happen in the 60s and they generated change, we're gonna do it again today with these issues. Let me ask you a question. If in the perfect world somebody said to you, do you agree? with defunding the police and then moving ahead with a brand new operation? Or would you rather see those that need radical and upending change get defunded and restart? Representative Provo, you made reference to a, a town that already did it or a city that already did it. Camden, New Jersey. Um, and you know the reasons why they did that? They had systemic problems with their police department, with police community relations. Um, you know, I, I guess you could ask which comes first, the defunding or the disestablishment. You know, I've heard all kinds of explanations for what defunding means. Some people take it literally to mean abolish the police and have written to me and asked me to make sure I abolish the police. Um, uh, and, you know, there are other more nuanced explanations that means, well, taking away some resources from the police and putting them elsewhere. And some people say, well, it's, it's actually um, figuring out how to uh, have fewer armed police and more people who are trained to do social work or de-escalation or youth outreach. And... I think that just goes to show it means many things to many people. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. The, the terminology, I think, is starting to scare some people. Yeah. Um, Senator Jalen, your thoughts? Defund, restructure, upend, rip apart? I don't know. Well, I think that one thing that I've been thinking about is that, like schools, police have taken on a lot of new roles over the years that they were not expected to do in the past. And so there's a conflict and sometimes a bit between their, um, their use of force and their communication and support. And I know that that is one of the things that some police have worked on. I don't know enough about it to make a judgment, but I think it's important um, to, to think about who gets sent to, um, a mental health emergency? Is it the right thing to have a person with a gun or is it a better thing to have a person, even a police officer, who might not be carrying a gun at that point? That some of, the it's, some of it's about training, some of it's about what are the jobs that need to be done in a community, um, and some of them do require the use of force. Some, there are some people who are dangerous to other people. Um, I am not in favor of releasing everybody that's in prison. I'm not in favor of, um, of saying that there are no times when people should not lose their liberty. But I think re-examining re when those things happen are very important. For example, in schools, um, 
I've heard good things about our school resource officer, but across the state, um, having a, a school resource officer increases the number of student arrests and it increases those arrests, um, particularly among uh, students of color, disproportionately. And those are bad outcomes for those kids. And some of those arrests are not for things that are dangerous or violent. They may be arguing with a teacher. So we are trying to ratchet that back and rethink uh, the work of, of, of uh, police officers in schools. And what did we replace it with? There are an awful lot of parents who want a police officer present to protect their child. There are an awful lot of teachers who want a police officer present to protect themselves. You have friend, you're a teacher yourself, Senator Jalen. I was. Right? Decades. Work. But, but I, you know, I have friends and relatives who are much younger than I am who are teachers, and some have been attacked by students. The question comes in, how do we protect everyone if we remove the police from schools? I think there's a, well, that's a long conversation, and okay. that's one that every uh, school has to have. Um, they are, school resource officers are required by law but they are also uh, limited to what is in an uh, MOU between the police department and the school department. And in the cases where you have a good MOU and a good school resource offer, officer, maybe that's fine. But I, we do know of many cases where schools become too reliant on the arrest um, policy instead of using disciplinary uh, actions that are not damaging to students and still maintain the peace. So this is, this is gonna require radical change because clearly the system that we've built up over the years is showing its age and it's starting to crack. So I think upending the system is always a good thing, challenge authority, but do not dismantle one way before you have another way built and tested and make sure it's what you want. We only have about 30 seconds left. So uh, Representative Provo, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Any closing and then Senator Jalen? Uh, closing, um, I, wish, I wish there were a closing. I wanna remind everybody that even though um, Massachusetts is reopening, that COVID is still out there. Um, it's still highly contagious. It is still, um, dangerous for a lot of people in capricious ways that aren't fully understood. You're not immune by being young, for instance. Um, and, you know, as I, I go around the city, you know, I see some people acting as if, um, as, as if there were no pandemic. The um, pandemic, yeah, the pandemic is over. Charlie Baker says we can go back into restaurants outside, so the pandemic is over. I've yeah. seen that behavior demonstrate itself all this week. Senator Jalen, what do you think? So I agree with that. And I also think that your closing remarks, um, Joe, uh, show that we have a lot of conversation that needs to go on, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So I know the aldermen, I think, are taking up issues tonight around the budget and policing, and I'm glad we have an active board. Uh, excuse me, not the aldermen, the councilors. City council. And, uh, that, and I know our mayor is interested in in pursuing that conversation. So great. I want to thank you both, and I make the commitment on behalf of Somerville Media Center. We are here to facilitate those conversations. On behalf of the Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. I want to thank my guest, Senator Jay Pat Jalen. Representative Denise Provo, both of you, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time. Thank you.